Well, it's a very great pleasure and a fantastic honor uh, to have all of you in the audience and to be um, celebrating what our team have done over the years. And it's always been a team effort. And um, I do my best to keep up to the standard of my colleagues <laughs> for presentations, which are, I think have been uh, very impressive and uh, thank them for it. So I'm going to try to give an overview of um, what we've been doing. You've heard quite a lot about uh, various aspects of it. It's over six decades, as you can see. Uh, but of course, um, uh, how do I get this to move? And it's not by pressing the normal. Oh, no. so that, that's working. Yes, uh, so um, it has many different uh, st stages. Um, we've obviously been interested in human uh, genomes and there the main interest over many years has been cancer. And you'll see that um, I have a company where we've got several cancer drugs on the market. Uh, so it's not just academic, uh, but at a very early stage, I realized that I didn't want to compete with my company uh, in, in the academic lab. So we did very basic research in uh, areas underpinning cancer. And you've just had a beautiful talk. Um, thank you very much uh, on that. Well, two beautiful talks uh, on, on that. Um, but we also uh, then uh, got involved. I, I, I met um, uh, various people working internationally on, on mycobacteria of various kinds, tuberculosis um, and, and, and others, and uh, beginning to understand the genomes of those and how we could use that information uh, to perhaps think of new targets. And then, of course, we took a few days off during the beginning of the um, uh, pandemic on, on COVID. And I think in the first month or so, uh, uh, produced quite a lot of data on the proteome from the genome. Uh, and um, that got it published eventually, but it was almost done, I think, in the first month of, of, of the pandemic. So, there are areas, um, and you've already heard, um, and I'll try to go over quickly the things that you've already heard, but you've heard a very nice talk from Amanda on the cryo-EM, and certainly the cryo-EM on this multi-protein target that you've heard, DNA-PK, has certainly been uh, one of the most important um, developments. And I thank Amanda and Dima and many others in the group. I mentioned some more names later um, for this work. And this is something that one just couldn't do with x-rays. It's a multi-protein system, um, which is very difficult to um, characterize and certainly I think impossible to crystallize. So that's where the cryoEM has come in and been so powerful over the past few years. And then uh, I think there are two revolutions uh, that we've had just in the last few years. And I'll say a little bit more about this because I came into the field of structural biology with Dorothy Hodgkin went 60 years ago, and there were two revolutions going on there. And I think it's only in the last few years, and really 60 years later, that we've had two revolutions uh, now, one in the cryo-EM and the other uh, in artificial intelligence um, uh, MI method, uh, AI method. So um, it's really been a very exciting time. Uh, and I think if I look back in the past 60 years, we've had changes which have been more radical in what we've been doing over the last few years than for many years before. So I'll talk a little bit about the AI methods. 
Uh, but you can see there the two revolutions that have occurred uh, in all our lives over the last uh, decade or more, but have really accumulated now. And um, we've used those uh, both in academia and in the company I formed most recently uh, to find drug uh, candidates. And I'll show you how we've uh, managed to see drugs that nobody's seen before, but they've been on the market, but only with cryo-EM. So seeing very tiny molecules within a very large protein. I'll say a little bit about that. And then I've always been interested in writing software. I, um, I won't give you too many details, but I wrote some software um, about, I don't know, 50 years ago, and Max Prutz came and uh, took me aside and said, Blundell, uh, you're supposed to be doing experiments. <laughs> Stop writing uh, all this software. And all I can say in retrospect is that, that um, my best software paper, one paper has 14,000 citations. Uh, so it's been used pretty widely. And, but it was quite a challenging time convincing the experimentalists that we should do some computational work, but I believe we should. And emerging resistance has been a very important area. And we've been able to use statistical methods as well as uh, AI. So that's the overview of my talk. In terms of years, um, I started in the University of Oxford um, in 61. I, I guess I ventured into the laboratory of Dorothy Hodgkin in, in, um, in 62. So um, uh, quite a long time ago and um, uh, realized she was doing very exciting work. And we spent a term there when I should have been doing other things in the university. But um, uh, eventually I got a good degree. And then um, I was very heavily involved in politics. I, I took over the city of Oxford for Labour. And we pedestrianised the centre and um, uh, Dorothy um, uh, Hodgkin said to me, Tom, she, she was very left wing and had a Marxist uh, husband, uh, but she said, Tom, I, I, I think you better decide what you're going to do. And so I had to stop my jazz group and I had to stop my politics and I moved to University of Sussex. And there I had just three years, I got a paper in Nature each year. And then uh, when I was 34, I got a professorship uh, in a department with 150 researchers. And that was a Birkbeck, very unusual place. I'll tell you more about that. Um, uh, and um, after Birkbeck, I was very reluctant to, to come, but Cambridge um, invited me to come and uh, think about the chair here in biochemistry. I actually wanted to stay in London because uh, the jazz, which I did myself, and the opera, which I went to passionately, were all in in um, in London. There wasn't too much culture in Cambridge, was my impression. <laughs> and so uh, eventually I, I, I came uh, and uh, had a very good period here in a wonderful department. So that's a bit of a long-winded background. Uh, but let me just go back. So the start of everything in structural biology, in my mind, uh, is due to Bernal, um, J.D. Bernal, who I already have been reading because of his uh, Marxist politics and very interesting things that he wrote. Um, and his, uh, at that time, uh, brief postdoc, Dorothy Hodgkin. And um, what they uh, decided was that they would try and look at um, some crystals of proteins and they should be able to get the structure. At first, they couldn't get any structure at all or any diffraction. And um, it was typical J.D. Bernal to realize that they had to be kept in a water environment. So when 
they uh, produced a capillary like this with a protein crystal. That was the beginning of structural biology. Uh, it was only when you kept the water environment uh, that you got the diffraction patterns properly, and that's an example. And so um, this is a statement that they wrote in Nature in 1934. So I'm not talking about even my era. Um, it's um, 90 years ago almost. And uh, that was uh, the, the real uh, paper that set everybody off doing structural biology using certainly x-rays originally. And um, so I, I joined um, the Hodgkin department uh, in 1962 for one term, in 64 uh, to do a PhD. But as insulin had been going on in Dorothy's lab already for 30 years, I thought I'd better do uh, a, a, a program for my PhD where I would learn the methodology uh, and get a PhD quickly. And then I could stay as long as I could uh, to try and help with the insulin project. So in 67, I, I started working on insulin. And um, I was the first person to stay in our family at school beyond the age of 15. But my family uh, was passionate about music and art. And that's where I was brought up, playing almost everything badly because I never had any lessons, but forming a jazz group when I was 13 and then doing it fairly commercially when I got to, uh, to Oxford, but also being influenced by my grandfather, who was an incredible artist and as well as being a musician and um, uh, not earning very much for it. And so I... Uh, over the years we enjoyed. So when we got the structure of, uh, of insulin on the top, the first thing I thought about was beauty. Uh, there are six subunits. I know there are 12 apostles, <laughs> but, but there's a certain similarity between the classical windows of churches and the beauty uh, of the insulin hexima. And that really took me. Uh, and then I started thinking about function, and um, I realized that the crystals uh, that we'd use for insulin had a very close relationship with uh, the storage granules. And the fact that we got crystals of insulin very early was because they were actually natural crystals used to store the insulin, which we just managed to grow a bit bigger. And uh, well, Dor Dorothy had. Uh, though Dorothy had been working on it for 30 years. And um, so that's uh, Dorothy Hodgkin and, uh, in a typical discussion. And it made me realize that people in science were really the critical thing, uh, working as a group, interactions and everything. It's just beautiful. And uh, I think that made sure that I wanted to stay in the area. So. Um, that was the, the background. We had a, a beautiful group, and I then realized uh, something else, and that was that the team that was already working on insulin, uh, while I was uh, I visited and worked with them for, for a few weeks, and uh, was well, term actually, but uh, they were from all different countries of the world, and Siv uh, Ramasenshan was. Um, very much involved in early work with Dorothy. And Dorothy Hodgkin, unlike almost any other British scientist, in the 1950s had yeah. gone to India and met people. And so in our group, we got Indians and people coming from all over the world, which was very important. But the, these are not Indians along the top, but New Zealanders and Australian, as well as uh, English. And um, so that uh, was what I decided to uh, join. And about the time I joined as, uh, uh, as a postdoc, having trained uh, doing some software and also learning x-rays, uh, Vijayan joined us. Vijayan became head of all Indian science and um, a very important influence. And we have people like Ted Baker from New Zealand 
but the very important thing to me was the social aspect of it. And what you see there is a party, a typical party a bit later on. And, and you see Dorothy Hodgkin there with David Phillips, who became Lord Phillips and ran all British science. And um, he um, had a relative who was um, a, a Labour councillor. And he came and uh, admitted to me because I was running the city of Oxford as a left wing Labour councillor while I was supposed to be working on insulin. And, and he said, I perfectly understood uh, and understand what you're doing and uh, was very supportive, as was Dorothy. But you see the parties we had, and I think they're very important aspects of the, um, uh, the work that we do. David Phillips, of course, became Lord Phillips and ran all British science. So that was the exciting background. But uh, I was um, uh, very conscious about what was going on in the city. And uh, that, that's uh, a little house that I had uh, in, in uh, East Oxford. On one side of that was the Morris Motors Press Still, a huge industrial estate and on the other side of it was the uh the uh, small um, center but the very beautiful one and suddenly uh we had uh, a suggestion come in in the late 60s that they will build a motorway coming in from the um, west side uh, across uh, parts of east oxford and then going through christchurch meadow and ending up in the area where, where uh, we lived. And as I've been very active in uh, uh, left-wing politics um, in uh, the university, I decided I'd stand in the council to block the motorway. And to my surprise, everybody said, you know, Labour's never had anybody uh, much in, in the council. Within two years, I got control of the whole of the city as a Labour yeah. councillor, uh, as a Labour councillor, uh, and I stopped the motorway going through, and I kept the centre of Oxford. I pedestrianised the centre of Oxford. If you go through, you know you can uh, only go a certain way, and then you have to go around uh, a little bit. All those things I did, um, and that was what fifty years ago, Morris, and, and they've never been changed. But it did uh, create a bit of a uh, a crisis for me, uh, and though I thought I'd done something, I mean, did I really want to be a politician? Um, and um, uh, uh, I certainly wanted to keep places like Oxford beautiful. Um, and I had done all these things, pedestrianizing the center and introducing bus lanes and everything, but I wondered what I should do. And um, Dorothy Hodgkin suggested I went away uh, and um, thought about it. So um, I then had a very interesting experiment in my life that not many people seem to have managed to do. And that is to take a, a year off and, and uh, have time to think, you know, should I be musician, politician or scientist? So I got on the train to Leningrad, which took me two or three days. Then I got on the train in Leningrad on the Trans-Siberian, and I spent, um, I think it was seven or eight days on the train going right the way across Russia, and then, then ending up in Kavarovsk. And then I hadn't really thought too much about getting out of Kavarovsk because I thought I'd go down into China, but then China was all locked and I couldn't go into China. And so I, I was wondering what I would do. And um, so I'd gone across the, the, the tunnel and I was stuck in Kavaros. And um, then suddenly as I was stuck there, a, a, a very incredible thing happened because uh, a um, very beautiful Japanese lady turned up with a very old Japanese man. And I wondered what they were doing. And they, um, it turned out, I talked to them, and it turned out the Japanese lady could speak just about every language in the world, certainly English as well as uh, Russian and, and so on. 
and she explained that the Russians and the Japanese had had a, a battle around like 1930 and the Russians were desperate to get the Japanese back on side. So they'd invited lots of Japanese ex-servicemen. So the battle was uh, in what, it was 40 years before this date, 1930, the Japanese-Russian. And so um, uh, they'd invited these Russian uh, ex-servicemen uh, back. And uh, one of them, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the Japanese uh, ex-servicemen back to Russia. And one of them had had a heart attack and she'd been uh, uh, keeping him. Um, and then he recovered enough to go back. And the Russians have put on a plane uh, to um, go uh, back from Russia um, uh, to Japan. So I, I thumbed a lift. It was a big plane and there was only two people on it. And they let me go on it. So I, I eventually got out of Far Eastern Russia and, and ended up in, 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 that was the seven days on the Trans-Siberian. I then went from there to Tokyo. And then I, I lived in Tokyo for uh, a, a while because this beautiful Japanese lady was willing to talk to me and I could learn. So Nihongo Ben Kyoshimasa, I studied Japanese. And um, then after a bit, I thought, well, I'd better go somewhere. I had a year off. And so I then uh, left there and went, tried to get into China, couldn't do that, went round the outside, stayed in Hong Kong, learning Chinese music and everything for a bit. And uh, in fact, I, I met um, a friend of mine who was staying there for a while, had a Chinese wife who was doing uh, Chinese music. And I have a big collection of Chinese instruments myself, but I don't really play them. Uh, and then uh, I continued on and ended up in Bangalore in India. Uh, that took quite a while to get round. Uh, yeah. but, and then yeah, what, what happened so is I met a lot of people who... Uh, what, what's happening there? Uh, 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 so um, th then uh, I visited Bangalore and there is Vijayan uh, who... Uh, I, I'd already met because he'd been in England. And uh, then I went and studied uh, Indian music. So um, I spent quite a long time learning the Veena and Carnatic music, which is the south of Indian. So um, then I, I thought I'd better uh, proceed a little bit and um, moved on. And so I went back, but then I, I said to uh, Dorothy Hodgkin, what shall I do? And she said, well, you're from Sussex, aren't you? Come back tomorrow. And so I went back to, uh, the next day. This is Dorothy Hodgkin, the Nobel Laureate. And she said, I've got your job in Sussex, Tom. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> um, I didn't even apply for it. So, so I went there and I gave, I, I gave up... Um, uh, my jazz, I gave up politics and, and I focused on um, on science. And you can see I got two uh, major papers in, in nature uh, in the three years I was there. Uh, and on basic, first on glucagon structure and then on insulin and then the yin and yang of, um, uh, of blood sugar control. And then I wrote a paper which was totally um, uh, different. This was an idea about uh, Darwinistic uh, evolution. And I think it was one of the first papers that were written explaining what was happening at the molecular level and how selection occurred. And so that uh, did me quite well. And then while I was at Sussex, um, I was talking to uh, uh, Louise Johnson, because David Phillips had been asked to write a review on protein crystallography and nobody had done that. So Louise and I began to write the review and then we realized we could write a textbook. So it, it, within the three years and doing all those other things, we produced the first textbook on 
protein crystallography. That has, I think, 500 pages, pretty long, and was used as a sort of bringing everything together about what everybody had been doing, but people were giving the results, but not the methodology. So I'm going to move on uh, because then I wondered where to go, and, and I suddenly got offered um, uh, when I was, um, what, uh, 34, the professorship in Birkbeck and 150 people in, in the department. So in uh, 1976, I took that over and I worked in London. And that was great for me because uh, as Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club, there was Covent Garden for the opera. And um, you can see why I never wanted to come to Cambridge. Uh, <laughs> and um, so what did I do um, uh, there? I started thinking about uh, what we would do. We needed to do some uh, structure uh, guided drug discovery, that was clearly an interest, uh, but we needed to understand biological space, uh, that's the structures of all the proteins, and we needed to know chemical space, which is where the small molecules might find. So I then structured my science into two areas. So one of the first things I did in the 1970s was uh, to define this structure of amazing um, uh, protein. It's a, a spartic proteinase. And, and um, this we published in, in, in uh, Nature. Uh, but we were one of the first, one of the first groups that defined uh, all the binding sites of, of, of pockets and understood selectivity and also all the hydrogen bonding that one needed if one was doing drug discovery. And the interest of that is we were working on aspartic proteinases, but relatives were things like renin, which are big targets for blood pressure control. So I converted it from a basic science into a translation. You'll notice the first author was Lynn Savanda, and uh, she, she became my wife, but I think at that time uh, wasn't. And uh, Dima was very much involved in these things. But as I was thinking about the pepsin, I, I suddenly realized that there was more in it. Um, I looked at that for a, most of a year before I realized that the folding in the two halves were identical, uh, um, although somewhat evolved. And there must have been an ancestor like this. And so I did what everybody told me not to do and that is to write a totally speculative paper on the evolution of these aspartic proteinases. And I predicted that that molecule on the right would exist, and it was all published in Nature. But uh, everybody told me I was being too speculative. Again, I got visits from Max Prutz telling me I shouldn't do that. Uh, yeah. And um, uh, But then... Six years, I looked for the molecule on the right-hand side, and where did I find it? I found it in HIV. And um, so uh, right in the HIV uh, genome, there was a proteinase, um, not very well characterized in the early description of the genome. And I, I was able to show that that uh, HIV polyprotein needed to be cleaved uh, into the separate gene uh, products. And the proteinase there uh, was exactly what I was looking for. So uh, in fact, what I predicted and published uh, uh, much earlier on, we eventually published as a, as a crystal structure. I, I actually predicted the structure first but I was told by everybody not to do any more predictions, do some experiments. And so that's the experiment. And we did it at the same time as Alex Vladova. And then that allowed us to think about new drugs for HIV, uh, which didn't have a target before. And um, we also to, began to understand the problem of resistance. So that was all very exciting. Uh, but then I realized that most interesting things were multi-protein systems, and that we needed a whole range of different ways uh, of looking at these, both sort of computational 
nanospray things, uh, uh, certainly x-rays, but then very importantly, I, I realized that cryo EM was going to be uh, very important. And so uh, we already had cryo EM where in Birkbeck, uh, but it was really the software developments that completely revolutionized as well as the detectors and so on. And so we began to, uh, to look at that. Uh, by, by the way, uh, you can see Dima sitting in the front row. <laughs> there was a key person in this, as was uh, Lynn uh, Sivanda. And um, so we then uh, have recently, and you've already had a lecture on this, so I'll, I'll whip through it, but um, I, I found this amazing person, Amanda, who uh, we recruited, and um, very quickly, uh, she got into this. She's told you the story. Um, when I prepared this, I had sort of conscious that she was going to give the talk before, but Steve Hardwick was very helpful as well. And we got the structure. And that was, um, uh, and I should mention Tonya's contribution as well. So that was the amazing structure that uh, Amanda showed you earlier on and showed that CryoM could give you these multi complexes um, in, in atomic detail. So then the problem was that, well, that was very well, we, that was one gene product, but there's 20,000 plus genes in the human genome and uh, even 4,000 in, in uh, MTB, tuberculosis. So I began to think about how I could look at those. And um, what I did was, to begin to think about software. So the idea was that if you had families of proteins, uh, I could learn from one to the other and write software. So the first um, software uh, we wrote was Composer. Uh, by the way, uh, there was a period in my life when all the software we wrote had a musical term because I felt I'd given up music for science. So I tried to put musical terms. But the composer was quite successful. But a couple of years later, Andre Shelley, who's now a very famous professor and member of the American National Academy, joined my group. And we um, wrote a program called Modeler. Modeler was uh, based on satisfaction of spatial restraints. And that single paper we wrote has 13,400 citations, one paper. And um, so you're not too surprised that Andre has become a very famous professor in the US. I was very lucky to have him. We were at Linica, but then we wrote other software as I moved to Cambridge uh, to really understand structure sequence relationships so we could select um, protein structures to build. So a whole lot of software was developed um, for modeling proteins and understanding the relationships. So these two methods, modeler and few, became very important. And we then used them to just model more or less the whole of the genomes of, of, um, uh, of different species. So mycobacterium tuberculosis, we could do 85% or something like that of the genome, you see the analysis on the bottom. Some of it was likely and unlikely. Uh, there's only around 70% or, or actually 65% that I was absolutely confident about. But most of the predictions uh, proved to be correct. So we then use this software to build models of whole genome, uh, gene products. And uh, this is uh, a good example. Uh, Pedro is somewhere you in the audience, Pedro, there, over there. So one of the things that Pedro did that he's already mentioned was to produce this database of structures for mycobacterium obsessus. But we had everything automated so we could have these structures predicted. And I should say that I never thought they were the absolute truth. I just thought they were a model that gave you features and the first thing you should do if you were going to work on it, you could select it based on my database. 
but you should do the structure first before you did anything else experimentally. And so that's what we would do. So we could model on many of these things like mycobacterium recessus, um, and you could get 88% of the genome modeled. This is Mabellini quite recently. And then uh, uh, this guy, um, his uh, Sandeep Chantana, has he arrived back yet? Uh, he, he, I think his plane got held up. He was supposed to come in uh, today for this. But Sunday uh, uh, suddenly arrived with the American leprosy mission, and they set up in our lab, and we started building uh, models uh, of, of that. And um, uh, there are one or two people in the audience here um, who've been uh, very much involved uh, with, with him. Uh, so um, we got models uh, of the proteome and uh, lots more since. But leprosy is, of course, a stigma, and uh, nobody had been working on leprosy very much. But you can see from the black regions in the map on the top right that leprosy is quite uh, uh, a problem in India, parts of Africa, and even uh, Brazil. Uh, and it's such a stigma that nobody admits it. So it's sort of a, as an unknown factor. So we've been working on that. And we also worked briefly on the SARS-CoV-2 and produced databases of the different features so that we could think about drug discovery and so on. So these are things that we've been doing. I better move on, I think. And then um, we've also um, uh, gone through and looked at uh, cancer gene sensors. So the, there are around 700 genes which are known to produce products that are critical in cancer. So the other thing we decided to do was to use the techniques to model all of those. And um, we got quite nice models for the 700 genes. And um, uh, we published that. And that's the work of Ali Al-Sulami, who's been around in the lab. And um, we're just using software that we've developed and I'll say briefly about. So in parallel to all this, we were thinking about chemical space. And um, so in 1999, I started having meetings uh, on Sundays. Um, and the reason it was Sundays is that um, the, the, the guy on the left-hand side is Harun Jyoti. He was in various companies but he was a student of mine earlier on, and he had some ideas that he wanted to uh, not do in companies, but to come out. So in Sundays, we planned a company, and then we needed a chemist, so we got Chris Abel, who sadly died re re quite recently. And we produced the idea of fragment-based drug discovery. And that is that instead of having a library of you know, huge, uh, 20,000 or something compounds to screen, you have a library of fragments, which are tiny ones. And this was a relatively new idea. And so we uh, formed a company, we proposed a company. I had two people working in the lab here uh, for a year, and then we got uh, quite a lot of money. Like we got half a million to begin with, but, uh, and then, um, uh, Harum was living above the local shopping centre uh, and coming in and we were thinking of the next stages. And then uh, we got a huge amount of money, uh, um, almost a billion altogether on the idea and developed this fragment idea. So you have tiny fragments, just a thousand, and you then build them into drug-like molecules. Every company in the world seems to be doing it now, but um, we were certainly in there at the beginning. And then uh, we built this uh, uh, nice new lab up on the Cambridge site and um, started uh, doing that. So we got um, a lot of drugs into clinical trials and um, uh, several of them uh, onto the market. And at that time, we were running out of money. And uh, so I sold the company, or we sold the company, for 886 million. So not bad for a, a dream in the lab down there with a couple of students. And um, 
uh, but I ought to remind you this is capitalism and you have to borrow a lot of money and pay back nine, 10, 11 times what you borrowed. So out of that sale of a billion dollars, nearly 886 million, I got absolutely no nothing. Uh, and I, I'm not kidding, absolutely nothing. And the company was so embarrassed about this that for the next few years, they paid me some money every every year. But it's just amazing. All the money goes to uh, investors at various other levels. So um, anyway, we got um, uh, drugs on the market for advanced breast cancer. And uh, they eventually got, a, a, well, they were in clinical trials and then they got on the market. So the first one was 2017, next one 2019. So by that time, it's worth a lot more than a billion dollars. Uh, but thankfully, they kept me on as their advisor, even though it was uh, bought by a Japanese company. And the reason I was so pleased that it was bought by a Japanese company is, well, first, I could speak Japanese to, to some extent still. And secondly, um, uh, I knew they were genuinely interested in what we were doing. If you just if I, we just sold it to many other places, they, they would have asset stripped us, closed it down, and I'd have had 150 people without a job. So uh, that was what we did, and it's worked out very well. So we've used these techniques. I better go quickly uh, on uh, things like tuberculosis and uh, go through the details, but. Um, I think many people don't realize how widely spread in southern Africa, for example, um, that that is. And uh, I got to know Bill Gates uh, pretty well. And um, Bill uh, um, encouraged us to, to move forward on drug discovery for tuberculosis and put, started putting in lots of money. And, um, and uh, Melinda Gates um, was very helpful. Uh, we had a bit of a problem because Bill and Melinda split up. And uh, so Melinda used to come up over here for dinner quite a lot and needed us to reassure her, but we kept her involved. But we kept friends with Bill as well. And uh, so we got money. And why it was important to me was that that area in Southern Africa is where my wife, uh, uh, is and that, there you see my wife in the middle. She's uh, her name is Bantignani, uh in Sibanda, which is an uh, African name from Zimbabwe, actually mixed between two languages. And there are two daughters, one either side, and and then there's our nephew and uh, niece who's still in in Africa. And so that was a very important thing, and we managed then. Uh, to go through various things on first and second line drugs, understanding them, and then developing uh, the methods we developed in um, Aztecs for tuberculosis and um, getting, so you use lots of screening things for fragments and then you elaborate them. This is the work of Sachin. Is Sachin still around? Okay. Uh, 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 yes. And um, uh, very good. And they, then we use all these techniques in the lab here, uh, uh, developing and, and getting molecules. Uh, and then Bill Gates came up. That's him walking up the steps between Chris Abel, who sadly died, and myself and the founders of the Aztecs company, and talking to him about what we could do. I, I made Bill put a, a lab coat on. That's him putting a lab coat on just upstairs. Uh, and um, and then we had a, a discussion. And you can see he was he's sitting in the chair there. And three of my uh, younger colleagues uh, are being interviewed by him and asked questions. He's just an amazing guy. But I thought my, my group did very well in responding. And so he put a lot of money into it, and we started um, then working there and got some quite interesting molecules. But the problem, this is Mycobacterium obsessus. This is related to Mycobacterium tuberculosis, but is involved in cystic fibrosis. And there are two places you, I mean, you can sell drugs in cancer here, 
but you try and sell drugs for a genetic disease where there are just a few people uh, or uh, for a third world disease, then you can't get any of the big pharma uh, to do anything. So the real challenge that I'm sure many of you are aware of is you can get drugs right through to the uh, beginning of clinical trials, but it's almost impossible to get anybody to pay for them to go through clinical trials. And that's the big challenge. So we've just recently, and I've uh, just show you a few pictures, of course, moved to cryo electron microscopy. And Shi Kang in our group has been working a lot on drugs there. And these are inhibitors uh, of, of cancer that have been around for a long time. And suddenly using the cryo-EM, uh, then Shi Kang showed that you could get the structures. So we got a, a, another nature paper. Uh, nice to have several nature papers each year. <laughs> and, um, and there we were. So just in the end, of course, we interested in uh, mutation analysis and uh, we've developed a lot of software for that using statistical methods. And um, Aaron, are you here? Right up the back, Aaron's been writing the statistical software. And then we've also used machine learning. And I think neither of these individuals are here, Douglas or, or, or David, but we've written a lot of software using then statistical methods and machine learning. And I think they're both very important in drug discovery. So I leave you that. Um, we've had a, a very nice time. Um, uh, we want to uh, predict likely sites for mutations to improve drug ability. We're incredibly dependent on uh, Dima, who's sitting here, and his other colleagues, Lee and Steve, are maybe almost certainly in the audience. Um, and um, so this has been a very collaborative exercise. And what we've been lucky is to uh, be able to take advantage of the revolution in the cryo-EM and in the machine learning and, and contribute in those areas. So this is the team. Um, and um, just amazing, Sandeep is on his way back from one of his uh, international leprosy things but uh, many of the other members here um, uh, are, are um, uh, major contributors. So I leave you with that. And just to say that we are now being thrown out of the university. Uh, as um, uh, The reason I'm being thrown out of the university is that I'm 80 years old. So I'm writing a book on race, gender, and age discrimination. So I, 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 I'm very pleased with that. Uh, so I've got some good material now. If the <laughs> vice, vice chancellor is listening, he's going to be very pleased with my commentary. <laughs> and I leave you with that. Thank you very much. Oh, that's a problem. Oh.